Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Reimagining Collaboration, Slack, Microsoft Teams, and Zoom, the post-COVID world of work. My name is Melissa Turk, and I'm the Interim Director for CMU's Office of Alumni and Constituent Engagement. We're happy to continue our series of webinars with today's event, and we hope that you'll enjoy this program and our future events. Before we begin, I do have a couple of logistical notes. As always, I want to thank you in advance and with your patience with any technical difficulties. If you do have any, please visit support.zoom.us. You'll note that there is a Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen. Please submit any questions throughout the presentation, but we will leave time at the end to address them. We're also offering 10 random attendees a free copy of Phil's book that he'll be presenting on today. I'll contact winners later this week to confirm shipping address and information. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce you today's presenter, Phil Simon. Phil Simon is a frequent keynote speaker, recognized, recognized collaborative and technology authority and college professor for hire. He's also the award-winning author of 11 books. Most recently, the book we'll hear about today, Reimagining Collaboration, Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, and the post-COVID world of work. He helps organizations communicate, collaborate, and use technology better. Harvard Business Review, MIT Sloan Management Review, Wired, NBC, CNBC, Business Week, and the New York Times have all featured his contributions. Um, and he hosts the podcast Conversations About Collaboration. Phil, thank you again for joining us. It's always a pleasure to hear your expertise. I will turn it over to you to get started. Thanks a lot, Melissa. As Melissa said, my name is Phil Simon. Thank you for your time. I've got 94 slides in 15 minutes, so let's rock. Here's the plan of attack for today. I'll do a bit of an introduction beyond what Melissa said. I'll talk about COVID, where we are right now, specifically with respect to work. Um, I'll then move on to the explosion of internal collaboration hubs. If you don't know what one is, don't worry, you will in about mm, 20 minutes. From there, I'll go to the hub spoke model of collaboration. I'll explain how we can use our tools at work in a much more holistic way. I'll make some predictions about the future of work, and then I'll offer some tips about how to navigate this future, some technology advice, as well as some management advice. And then we should have time for about 10 to 12 minutes of Q&A. Okay, and warning from the beginning, I tend to drop a lot of pop culture and movie references. So those are not mistakes. Uh, fun fact, when I was, oh gosh, 19 years old, a million years ago at Carnegie Mellon as a sophomore taking statistics in Professor Banks's class, he always started off every lecture with a quote from a statistician or anyone really. And I remember thinking to myself, if I'm ever doing that in the future and I was a college professor for four years, I'm gonna steal that. So in keeping with that vein, quote of the day comes from Mr. Churchill, never waste a good crisis. No doubt that COVID is a crisis. It hopefully is coming to an end, particularly in this country, but it is also a significant opportunity. But before we get into that, let's just take a snapshot of where we are now, because I would argue that the world of work has irrevocably changed. As of fairly recently, most workers are still not back in a physical office, particularly in the knowledge world work, it, sure healthcare and Amazon Fulfillment Centers never really got time off, but if you're a knowledge worker, you've been able to work remotely. In fact, roughly 56% of US workers are working remotely all the time or part of the time. Now more workers wanna to return to the office, specifically younger ones who are either sick of living with their parents or haven't made the social connections that you would in a physical office, but most employees are not ready to return to work. 23% say that they would stay remote permanently if given the option and a ridiculous percentage of employees are threatening to quit if they don't have at least hybrid work in the future which begs the question is remote work here to say stay and yeah um, again there are just an insane number of remote offerings right now i saw a couple of weeks ago on linkedin uh, the economic research part of linkedin said that there were 576 percent more job openings with the word remote in the title compared to a year ago. But I went to Carnegie Mellon and I'm a data guy, so let's keep going with the data. 77%, that's the percentage of employees according to Owl Labs, said that if they keep working from home, they will be happier. Uh, more than three in four, um, a fascinating number. Here's another good one, 54%. As I mentioned before, uh, a very high percentage of employees will quit if they can't walk. And even if your employer doesn't offer it, again, based on what we know from LinkedIn, 
there are plenty of places that will. And we'll see a little bit later how technology is a key part of that. Long story short, people want their work to revolve around their lives, not the other way around. Again, we're in the middle of the greatest work from home experiment ever and the days of commuting an hour and a half just to have your manager watch you code or be in pointless meetings um, in large places are think, I think are going to come to an end. Another good number, 80%. Um, this is the percentage of employees who want to work from home at least three times per week after companies lift their COVID guidelines. Again, in some cases it's more, in some cases it's less, and there is an interesting divide when it comes to younger employees, again, who just don't have that social capital built up with colleagues. Maybe they got hired during the pandemic and no one knows who they are apart from an avatar in Slack or Microsoft Teams, so they want to make themselves known, but most of us want at least some flexibility in the future. So that begs the question, could we go back to work if we wanted? Well, in fact, many people can't. A Wall Street Journal reported not that long ago that something like 7 million Americans moved to a different part of the country during the pandemic. Here is an interesting data visualization of where people moved. You can see a lot of people went to Florida, a lot of people moved out of California, but uh, one of my books, The Visual Organization, is about interactive data visualizations and stuff like this just geeks me out. Gosh, I remember studying data viz a million years ago at Carnegie Mellon and a lot of this still holds up. So people have in many cases moved away and even if their employers mandated that they return to work, they just couldn't do it. So where did we go? This visualization is certainly helpful, but let's look at some raw data. And from August, 2020 to the same period in 2019, we see that people tended to move away from cities, New York, San Francisco, Seattle, Boston, Portland. I was just reading today on LinkedIn how California is actually making a bit of a comeback because of the growth of technology stocks and the tech workforce in general is pretty tech savvy. They maybe want to stay there, but then we've seen people go to other parts of the country, like say Jacksonville, Salt Lake City, Sacramento, Milwaukee, Kansas City. I know that in Montana and Boise, Idaho, there's actually a backlash against people moving there because it's driving up rents, although some people are saying, how is my house worth $400,000 when I paid half that five years ago? So it's really interesting to look at some of the data that's driving all this. So this begs the natural question, can people be productive when they are away from home? And I mentioned that I'd be dropping some pop culture references. I'm a big Simpsons fan. And let's just ask the question, have employees been productive while at home? Well, the data indicates that, generally speaking, yes, not only as productive, but in fact, more so. But again, don't believe me. Let's look at the data. Roughly three in four employees, according to Gallup, say that they are more productive from home. Now, there are a lot of reasons for that. You can certainly say that they don't have to commute, even though, in theory, you could be productive on your smartphone or your tablet. If you aren't in the office, um, you probably should be texting and driving, but that's a different discussion. Um, by some accounts... Um, we are working longer. Um, again, from 3.1 million Americans, they found that there's been an uptick in emailing as well and the use of some of these tools that I'll talk about a bit later. But in theory, we're working an extra 48 minutes a day. And again, we may be coming out ahead. If my commute each way was an hour in traffic and now I just have to work at home an extra 48 minutes, in theory, I could be better off. So again, it's going to depend on the position, but there is certainly some data to indicate that we have not lost a beat. Okay. And this begs the question, how and why have we been so productive at home? Now, I would argue that we are using fundamentally better tools. This is the premise behind my new book. But again, don't believe me. Here's a fun fact I found from eBay in 2018. The company did an internal employee survey, and they found that roughly four and five employees said, as a company, we're committed to collaboration. But guess what? Roughly half that felt that the tools allowed them to collaborate. And this is eBay, right? This isn't some old school hospital or law firm. I've actually spoken at eBay headquarters in 2014. They do technology pretty well, but even a bellwether like eBay did not have the sufficient technology to let employees collaborate effectively. So again, in this, in this crisis, there is opportunity. So the premise behind my new book is that tons of people are using new collaboration tools. Right? There is nothing like forced adoption. You could have argued many times, as I did as a consultant, that sending a bunch of email wasn't the best way to go. But when people start working from home, 
and it's tough to have in-person meetings, then something like Zoom or Slack or Microsoft Teams becomes a lot more tenable. And these are just some of the tools that people have absolutely adopted in droves. If you wonder what Google Workspace is, that's the company's probably 10th effort to rebrand Google Drive. Um, they're now thinking about it as this holistic suite of tools, right? That includes much of the functionality that you'll see in the other ones. Long story short, these vendors keep a close eye on each other to see what they're doing, right? Uh, Slack's an interesting case study as well, because back in, I want to say late November of last year, as my book was coming to print, going to print, um, Slack decided to pony up $28 billion. I'm sorry, Salesforce decided to pony up $28 billion for Slack. And if you think that Slack is just email 2.0, Trust me, uh, Salesforce is not spending that much money for a better way of doing email. So we saw rapid adoption of new technologies in a short period of time, which obviously brings us to the Vladimir Lenin quote, there are decades where nothing happens and there are weeks when decades happens. Again, the pandemic accelerated trends that were already taking place. In March of 2020, I believe that e-commerce as a percentage of overall commerce in the United States upticked from 18% to 28%. We certainly saw, and I saw this as a college professor, the rapid adoption of hybrid or online learning. Right? So companies started adopting tools and workers followed suit. But again, don't believe me. Microsoft Teams fairly recently announced that it had jumped to 145 million daily active users. And again, if you think that this is just another way of doing email, I will beg to differ and show you how that is not the case a little bit later on. I mentioned before Salesforce agreeing to buy Slack for almost $28 billion. A fun fact I saw a couple of days ago on LinkedIn that Salesforce, the largest CRM customer relationship management company out there, is going to rewrite its whole technology, bit of a buzzword here, stack based on Slack. So they see tremendous opportunity to do all sorts of different things when it comes to the future of work. And then arguably there's the poster child for the growth of these collaborative tools. You guessed it, I'm talking about Zoom. Uh, when I did a webinar with the CMU Alumni Association, I think it was about 14, 15 months ago, I mentioned Zoom, which was just exploding. But if you didn't happen to see that one, um, Zoom went from 10 million primarily enterprise users at the end of December 2019 to 200 million and then 300 million primarily consumer users. If you think that those two groups are not equal, trust your instincts. The Zoom bombing that became a, a very popular back in March and April of 2020, again, wasn't a problem when enterprise users used it. They didn't think about schools and yoga studios and all that. So Zoom has fixed it. And again, if you had bought Zoom stock before the pandemic, let's just say that the first round is on you. It is absolutely explode, exploded. So those are just some of the tools that I'm talking about. But being a Carnegie Mellon person, I'm a big fan of data. And Melissa, I would love to do our first of two polls. Looks like Zoom is in the lead. Oh, Teams, respectable. Obviously, some people use more than one, which again is not uncommon. Cool. Okay, good to know. And we've got one more. Let's see how good people are with these tools. I love the confidence. Carnegie Mellon, technology, baby. Nobody is weak. I love it. Okay, so around two and three folks think that they're pretty good at using these tools. Um, pretty good percentage. Just a couple more seconds. Okay, great, Melissa, thanks. Okay, so we did our polls. All right, now in a way it's a false dichotomy to say we'll be either working from home or not because certain industries lend themselves to remote work more than others, right? I guess you could technically have a robot dentist but going to the dentist's office is freaky enough without some machine in your mouth. So which industries are best suited for a return to work? And this brings up one of my favorite quotes from 
fun fact, the inventor of cyberpunk, William Gibson, the future is here. It's just not evenly distributed. Again, at a high level, knowledge workers are much more likely to be able to work from home. I'll show you shortly some examples of some banks and financial institutions that are saying, wait a minute, we actually want people back in the office, but if you're in management, if you're in IT, you can probably work from home reasonably effectively. But you know, if you look at any of the student polls around, say, online education, they, they think it sucks. They think that they're spending a fortune for Zoom University. And again, as someone who's a former college professor, I can tell you that it is very difficult to give an effective lecture or reach a student when you're speaking into a void. And there are obviously privacy concerns if you've got students not willing to share their webcams and can you read facial expressions, body language, things like that. Uh, utilities, hospitality, yeah, they're gonna be a little bit tougher to do remotely. So again, one size does not fit all. And at a high level, I have found that there are three different buckets for the ways that companies are preparing for the future of work. One is that we will require employees to be on site. We will require employees to be really wherever they want. So they can always be remote. It doesn't really matter as long as they get the work done. And then finally, some type of hybrid environment. Let's break it down. Bucket one, again, some financial institutions. We want to pretend that COVID never happened. Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan famously came out, said this, Amazon wants even white collar employees back in the office. So these folks believe that there's a certain magic that takes place when everyone's in the office. And to be fair, there is something to be said for this. Um, you can run into a colleague getting lunch or in the elevator. And before you know it, you start talking. Google famously had a 20% rule, letting employees work on whatever they want because they realized that if they stuck to their core search business, eventually they could get disrupted, uh, let's say BlackBerry. So there are uh, benefits to colliding uh, with employees in the office. Next up, we don't care where people work. Uh, Twitter, Shopify, Lincoln Financial, Dropbox, a lot of these are tech companies and they flat out have said, it doesn't matter. Right. As long as you get the work done, you know, maybe you want to come in the office a couple of days a week, but there are certainly benefits that I'll talk about later of adopting this type of approach. And finally, a hybrid approach to work. In other words, it's complicated. Right. And in a way, if you're going all remote or you're mandating that everyone needs to be there, then you can design a set of rules and everyone follows them. But what happens if it's sometimes people are there, sometimes they're not, who gets to decide what days do people work, but if everyone wants to work the same day in the office. So this is a fairly complicated strategy, but again, workers have expressed a strong desire to do this. So Citibank or Citigroup, Ford, TIA, CREF, Target, um, Salesforce is another one I mentioned earlier, the, the company that bought Slack. So these are bellwether companies that are trying to figure out what the hybrid world of work looks like. I know with Salesforce, they're saying it's actually all three. If you work in maintenance or security, that's really tough to do remotely. I'm talking about physical security, not IT security. If you're serving food, that's tough to do remotely, right? But then there are other positions that say you're a coder, you may not have to come into the office at all. But for certain managerial positions or for certain types of activities, you'll need to be there. So again, one size does not fit all. This begs the question though, why not force everyone back at the office? After all, the, the constitution doesn't exist in the workplace. If your manager says you need to be here on Monday, there's no law mandating remote work. This brings to me one of my favorite quotes here from Don Omeyer, former Monday Night Football producer who famously said, the answer to all your questions is money. Well, what do I mean by that? This is a Bloomberg quick take from Twitter a few months ago about how certain companies are saying, look, we're in San Francisco. You want to live in Denver. You want to live in Idaho. That's fine, but just don't expect to make the same salary. In fact, expect these types of wage cuts if employees don't need to live in a high-priced area like Silicon Valley, New York, Boston, some of the cities that I mentioned earlier. So there is a huge employee salary benefit for the employer to pay people less. The other elephant in the room, you guessed it, real estate. Pinterest dropped, gosh, time flies, almost a year ago, nearly 90 million. That's a lot of cheddar to terminate a San Francisco office lease, right? Think about it, you don't need as much physical space. Uh, this is why co-working may be an interesting place to invest, not that I'm an investment advisor, but I'll get to that shortly. So there are financial benefits, but it is not just all about the money. This is Brian Elliott, he is part of Slack's Future Forum and he believes that this is a tremendous opportunity, going back to my Churchill quote, to redefine or reimagine work. We can take a look at things that weren't working before and figure out a better way of doing them. Again, never waste a good crisis. I mentioned before, productivity increases from working at home. Well, I'm not the only one who thinks so. This is Sundar Pichai. He's the chief executive of Alphabet. That's the parent company of 
Google. And in December 2020, he said that the company was committed to making hybrid work possible. In his words, there's this opportunity for tremendous improvement in productivity. Plus, you can pull in more people into the workforce, right? If you work in San Francisco and you're across the street from Apple or Twitter or Facebook, what if you could expand that to pretty much anywhere in the world? So there are massive non-financial benefits to adopting remote work. Other benefits, again, you can position yourselves as employee friendly. Look, if you want to pick up your son from soccer practice at 2.30 every day, that's fine. If you have a, another personal situation or just not a night person or a morning person, we can accommodate that. This is potentially a game changer when it comes to coveted employees, right? Those folks always have a ton of options. And it's one thing if you say, oh, yeah, we're employee friendly, but you pretty much need to be here Monday through five. Monday through Friday, nine to five, versus saying, again, we have very little expectation for you to do that. As long as you get the work done, you'll be judged on your output and not on your timing. So in my opinion, regardless of the employment model, technology will play a major role in the future of work. But we are just scratching the surface of these tools. When people think about Zoom, they say, oh, for videos. Well, it's a lot more than Skype 2.0. I wrote a 400 page book called Zoom for Dummies. Trust me, you can do a lot more than video calls. Or if you think of Microsoft Teams as Slack as Outlook 2.0, again, you could not be more, stake, more mistaken. These tools are much more powerful and that's basically the rest of my webinar. Thinking of these tools only as email or Skype 2.0 reminds me of one of my favorite jokes from the comedian Gary Goldman. He says that your phone, right, is more than just a phone. <laughs> it's kind of like saying that your Lexus convertible is in a very expensive cup holder. These technology tools can do so much more if we only understood what they could. So what if we used Slack, Teams, Zoom, Google Workspace, a workplace by Facebook, it's hard to even keep track of them all, in a deeper and much more holistic way. In other words, we didn't think of having 12 different apps running on our computer, but we really thought about a single gestalt. And I'm talking here about internal collaboration hubs. The best way I can describe it is that they are almost digital headquarters. More specifically, I define them in the book as a general use software application designed to promote effective communication and collaboration. What does that mean? Well, ideally in an organization, all conversations, decisions, documents, institutional knowledge exists in this hub. And hubs critically connect to different spokes. I'll explain what that means shortly but they enable a great deal of automation with little or no technical skill. If you can install an app on your phone, odds are you can take advantage of the HubSpoke model. And again, the most popular hubs today are some of the ones that I've already mentioned, Slack, Teams, Zoom, Google Workspace. And this is essentially my model visualized. You've got the hub in the center and you connect these different spokes. I'm talking about software applications designed for a specific purpose. I'll explain what I mean shortly. But general categories of spokes include productivity, content creation, a CRM applications like Salesforce I mentioned earlier, a project management tool, an ERP or enterprise resource planning tool like Workday. And spokes can exchange information with hubs. Again, this ties everything together. They can provide status updates. They can reduce the amount of manual work, right? So all of your organizational group, department, um, division, communication, and collaboration should markedly improve. Okay. Um, so uh, what's going on here? <laughs> Might help if I hit the arrow the right way. I was wondering why we were going backwards. Sorry, <laughs> my fault. Uh, so this is just an example of one of the spokes. And if you put this all together into one, you've got this, again, holistic model. If you've got a document um, signing tool like um, DocuSign, you've got um, Workday and ERP system. Um, again, this is all connected into the hubs, and I'm far from the only person who is thinking this way. Uh, this is a visual from Slack and how you can connect uh, what they used to call Google Drive or Zoom or DocuSign into the hub. And it's important to realize that these hubs facilitate two-way communication. Yes, I could update Slack from Salesforce and vice versa, or if I put in a comment in a Google Doc, Slack can notify me of that. I'm not getting an email. And I'll explain a little bit later in this webinar why email is so pernicious. In fact, I wrote a book in 2015 called Message Not Received, detailing the ills of using email. The other important part of this diagram is that everything is connected. You build this comprehensive knowledge base such that if an employee leaves the company, someone else joins to take 
his or her position, that person can more quickly grasp everything that's taken place before his or her arrival. Now, connecting hubs and spokes is fine, but you might be thinking, wait a minute, I'm not a computer programmer or software developer, although if you went to Carnegie Mellon, what do they say? Uh, even the poets there know how to code, right? So at a high level, how do you connect hubs and spokes? It's a lot easier than you think. In short, there are three ways of doing it. Um, I'm gonna cover the first way. Um, some of you may have heard of Asana. It's a very popular project management tool. It's a little bit like Trello. It's a little bit like Basecamp. There are a bunch of them out there, but uh, Basecamp has been around for quite a while uh, and Asana has as well. In fact, Asana supports roughly 82,000 paying customers and millions of free organizations use it. Uh, organizations use it on a free basis across something like 190 countries. So if I wanted to integrate Asana to one of these hubs and put the hub spoke model into action, how would I do that? In short, one way would be an app. If you use Microsoft Teams, you can install the Asana app for Microsoft Teams. Again, click a mouse, you authenticate, bada boom, bada bang, you're in and guess what? You've got Asana existing within Microsoft Teams. So you can't do everything in Asana, don't get me wrong, right? But for many things, status updates, certain functionality, you can do that without having to leave Teams. This is a big deal. Pretty cool, huh? But wait, some of you on that poll I asked earlier said I use Slack. I want in on this action. Don't worry, you can do that as well. This is the Slack app directory and guess what? There's an Asana app for them as well. But what if you just didn't wanna connect one app, right? Or one spoke, right? Well, you can do that too with a bunch of these things. So one option is to connect it through a native app but sometimes there isn't a native app, right? So what happens? Again, do you have to roll up your sleeves and code or call the IT department? Not necessarily. Option two, there are these connectors. I'm talking about Zapier, Airsplate, Slate, If This Then That, Airtable, Workado, or Microsoft PowerFlow, right? These are ways to effectively connect a hub to a spoke without writing any code. These are what they call with no code or low code solutions. Sometimes people call them RPA for robotic process automation. So I can effectively build a bridge because someone said, wow, there is no Basecamp app for Zoom but I'd like to connect it. If you can work a mouse, you'll type in basically your source system and your target system. And through a series of drop downs, you just decide what you want it to do. So that's option two, take advantage of one of these connectors. If there isn't a way of doing that, then yes, you can absolutely get your IT department involved using software development kits, webhooks and applica application programming interfaces, APIs and build custom integrations. So there are lots of ways to connect hubs and spokes. And if you connect them all, again, you wind up getting this single gestalt, right? Everything is connected together, right? I'm talking about ticket management systems like Zendesk, content management systems like WordPress. Everything is stitched together, right? But you might be thinking to yourself, why do this? And yes, that's an Ocean's Eleven reference. Well, I'd argue that the tools absolutely matter. Um, I've not seen any research on hub spoke collaboration because quite frankly, I kind of coined the term but I strongly suggest in the book that if you've got more people using the collaboration hub and using it deeper, the quality of your collaboration will be better. And researching the book, I came across OfferUp. They're doing really well now because the market for used goods is exploding with some of the supply chain shortages and some of the other issues taking place in the country right now. But I interviewed Natalie Angelilio for the book. She was actually on my podcast and we were talking about how Early on in the company's history, it used Slack, but not in a deep way. Once it did go all in on Slack and effectively embrace the HubSpoke model, they eliminated internal email and they started to see real benefits of collaboration beyond using all these disparate tools in a very disjointed way. More benefits, eliminating or potentially reducing manual work, right? No, it's not going to completely go away, but what if you could put a major dent in it? What if you could eliminate copying and pasting things from one system to another? I had on Kevin Roos, who's a New York Times reporter and best-selling author on my podcast, and his new book is called Future Proof. And the podcast is called Don't Be an Endpoint. And in his view, and I completely agree with him, that if your job is to take data from system A and put it into system B, or you're an Uber driver, right? You're taking a person from point A to point B, well, eventually, Maybe that gets eliminated through automation and artificial intelligence or robotics. So this is one benefit of actually doing more work, more valuable work 
as opposed to the manual stuff, which let's face it, most people don't like doing. You could also increase organizational transparency. And you might be thinking, well, our organization is pretty, pretty transparent. I'm not so sure. Again, sending mass emails to everyone don't necessarily, doesn't necessarily make sure that it all gets read. But if you post things in channels, you tend to lead to a more transparent organization. And this is a very real gap. Um, Kelton Global did a study with Slack about organizational transparency. So for business owners that describe their organizations as very transparent, 55%. If you're thinking that the percentage of employees who agree with that assessment is lower, trust your instincts, roughly one third of that. This brings us to adopting the hub spoke model of collaboration, right? There are so many benefits to doing this. Uh, near the top of the list again is building this comprehensive knowledge repository. I'm gonna geek out on that in a second, but again, you don't have to spend a bunch of time multitasking and trying to find things, right? Everything exists inside the hub, right? And the search capabilities of these hubs are, trust me, are getting a lot better. I know that early on when Slack and Microsoft Teams launched, the search capability wasn't as great, but they are getting much, much better. Um, again, I don't have to spend time trying to find key documents, and this is very much a big deal. Statistics vary on this, but here's one study, according to McKinsey, employees spent, I think this is back in 2012, so 1.8 hours a day searching for documents. Let's say that it's a third of that, right? 0. 0.6 hours, 36 minutes. Would you like to have back 36 minutes of every day? I think so. And if you're talking about hundreds or thousands of employees, you're talking about a significant period of time. Next up, employees don't have to multitask as much. Cal Newport has written a couple of best-selling books about the benefits of deep work. And if you're constantly moving back and forth and multitasking, you're actually inhibiting deep work. You're much more likely to make mistakes. So if I know that everything's in the hub, it's much more likely that I can spend most of my time there and multitask less. And this is, I think, the big longer-term benefit, setting the stage for artificial intelligence and machine learning enhancements. If any of you have ever seen this movie with Joaquin Phoenix, her about a guy who falls in love with an operating system because that OS knows him so intimately, that's exactly where we're going with this. In chapter 15 of my book, I put on my Swami hat and make some predictions for the future. And I think that the hub will be able to answer questions we didn't think of asking. It'll be able to determine things like employee sentiment or which employees are disengaged at work, things that, again, we just can't determine as well right now. This leads me to predictions. Where are we going with hubs and spokes? Um, again, expect more and more companies to ditch internal email for communication. I'll come back to that shortly, but long story short, it isn't a very good mechanism for that type of thing. Hubs will become more external. You can absolutely use these things inside of an organization, but Slack's got a product called Slack Connect that effectively allows two different organizations to collaborate through a secure pipeline, right? So their independent workspaces are connected through a single channel and expect these other vendors to copy from this. But let's say that I work at Carnegie Mellon and I'm doing some research with some folks at Pitt. We both use Slack, but we want to be able to communicate or collaborate specifically around cancer research or whatever we're doing. Um, all things being equal, and maybe they never are, but companies that embrace hubs and spokes, I think will outperform companies that cling to these antiquated methods, right? The sooner that companies adopt the hub spoke model of collaboration, again, all things being equal, the better off they'll be. Don't get me wrong, if you are making blackberries and the market for blackberries dried up, oh, I don't know, about 13 years ago, don't expect hubs and spokes to reverse that. But if I have no other information, I'll bet on the company that's embracing hubs and spokes. They'll also become more powerful and tightly integrated in the future, but again, don't believe me. Back in February of this year, after the book had come out, Microsoft announced something called Project Viva. And in a nutshell, it's Microsoft's ambitious attempt to wrap everything in the universe around Teams. So Teams becomes your operating system. Teams is the glue that connects everything. And not just Microsoft products like PowerPoint, Excel, uh, Dynamics, Azure. I'm talking about third-party systems like Salesforce or Workday. Pretty much anything can be connected into Teams. If you want, check out Satya Nadella, the CEO's 30-minute overview of it. Um, take a deep breath, though, because again, it, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, also, Zoom announced that it had crossed 1,000 apps, third-party apps, developers basically taking Zoom's core offering in interesting directions. Back when I wrote Zoom for Dummies a little over a year ago, they were only at 200. So again, these were trends that were already taking place, but the pandemic merely accelerated. Other predictions, um, I expect co-working spaces to rebound. In fact, some companies are trying to retire the term office. They want to get together for more purposeful business travel. 
and there might be team bonding or collaboration. You won't necessarily need to go in an office just to have you, your boss watch you work. And co-working spaces, again, um, I think have a lot of potential here. Airbnb, excuse me, I would be shocked if it didn't get into commercial real estate along with its brand and the number of properties throughout. Companies are going to want to lean into the flexibility and if they're using hubs and spokes, they will have a digital headquarters irrespective of where employees work. So tips, what do I do with 42 minutes or whatever of information? Well, here in a nutshell, get rid of email for internal communication if you have it. Based on what some of you showed me earlier, many of you have already done that, but just at a high level. And again, I go off on this in my book, Message Not Received. Email was never designed for collaboration. It's a quick way to exchange information. In fact, it's rooted in typewriters. If you ever wondered what the CC or BCC stood for, you can Google it, but it's basically a carbon copy. So not exactly the most contemporary of tech. Organizational knowledge dies when an employee leaves the company. Think about all those documents, all those cor all that correspondence that existed in inbox. And unless the IT department dredges up your email, it's just not accessible to other people. Uh, email, only one bite at the apple, right? Sometimes you can recall a message, maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. But if I had a nickel for every time I forgot an attachment or misspelled the word, I'd have more than a few nickels. The beauty with Teams or Slack or Zoom is that you can edit your message and again, reduce the cognitive load of someone seeing, oops, I meant this, oops, I meant this, four messages when it really should have been one, trust me, neurologists will tell you that that stuff adds up. Email last, lacks context. I'm getting a message from anyone about anything. How does that work, right? Your brain needs some time to respond versus if Melissa sends me a message in Slack about this webinar, right? I know it's from her about this webinar. Right now, it might be something completely off the wall, but again, your inbox is basically anyone's attempt to contact you about anything. Your brain needs time to figure that out, no matter how descriptive your subject line is. Also, by and large, email notifications are binary. Right? Yes, you can set up different rules if it's got urgent or a red exclamation point. You know, maybe forward to my cell phone, but for the most part, they are binary. And the tools that I've described today, the hubs have incredibly sophisticated controls for customizing notifications. And that's now, again, in the future, when we talk about AI and machine learning, they're gonna get really good. And email just doesn't connect to as many spokes. Again, if I've got Gmail or Outlook, could I forward that message to Teams or to Slack? I can, but it's fairly limited because these software vendors understand the limitations of email. Next up, stay in your lane. Uh, there are certainly companies, in fact, some of you may work for them uh, because I saw the poll earlier, Some Folks were using Teams and Zoom or Teams and Slack or Zoom and Slack. And that's fine. You can, particularly in small, larger organizations. Sometimes people have different licenses with different companies, but you get much more benefit if you stick with a particular hub. I would use the hub as part of your hiring process. If your organization buys into it, why would you send out forms to people over email? And it's very easy in Slack or Teams or Zoom to create a guest account. And the employee or the applicant who says, oh, I'm absolutely collaborate, collaborative, but then refuses to use Slack or Teams, says, I only do email, you can still hire that person, but isn't that an interesting data point on whether the person is truly collaborative or maybe just telling you what you want to hear? Um, I would use them throughout the organization. Again, as we saw earlier with OfferUp, you can use them for departments, you can use them for groups or teams, but you tend to do better throughout the organization um, if the entire organization buys into the hub spoke model. Also know going in that generally speaking, and there are exceptions to this rule, but the bigger the organization, um, the tougher it is many times for people to collaborate, particularly if it's a successful, mature organization. Um, just know this going in, you're probably going to get some resistance from folks who are say 55 years old and they've done it this way for 30 years and they really don't see the need for change. Um, also, if you're a startup and you build this into your culture from the beginning, it tends to be a lot easier as you grow older. So there tends to be an inverse correlation here. Next up, uh, look at your existing business processes. Can you automate them? In many instances, the answer is yes, right? If you think about say DocuSign, right? That is a better way of getting a document signature than email, but there is a DocuSign app for Slack. So that's actually a way of making that even better. And if I'm collaborative employees don't come around, um, this stuff is serious. Um, I had a discussion in 2015, I think right before I moved here to Arizona uh, with a startup and they tried to coach an employee who would not use Slack, which was their collaboration hub. And eventually she just said, I'm not going to use it. And they said, well, this really causes problems for everyone else. So there's the door. Um, it is important for organizations to use this. 
Um, if one person doesn't do it, then the conversation gets bifurcated and you spend a lot of time trying to find out you know, where a piece of information or a file may be, which again, uh, um, undermines part of the benefits of the HubSpoke model of collaboration. Um, I'd start connecting new spokes to your hub. You don't have to do them all at once. You may wanna take it a little bit slow, but you'll find that it's incredibly easy and the benefits of them, I think far exceed their costs. That's my story and I'm sticking with it. If you want to find out anything more about me and my madness, here's my contact information. I want to thank you for your time. And as promised, we've got, oh, wow, about 15 minutes for Q&A, although I'll stay on as long as you like. Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, Bill. And I will say I'm knee deep in his book right now and learning um, a lot about what I should be doing. <laughs> and uh, it, it was nice to hear kind of your rendition of it in person here. So I appreciate that. We do have some questions coming in. Um, feel free to add them in the Q&A. We'll get to as many as we can, but I can't promise we will get to all of them. Um, so the first one is, um, is there a risk to get into a new toy syndrome where you're just having all these tools without properly understanding how they really impact the team collaboration? Absolutely. Um, I've been around enterprise technology for a very long time. I, I know about the shiny new thing shiny new thing syndrome. That's why I think it's important to do your research, to think about the kind of organization. Um, uh, and feel free to disagree, Melissa, but you know, in my book, I don't have all the answers. I ask a lot of questions. I throw out different approaches, different considerations, because again, if you're a small tech startup, you're going to face a very different type of challenge than you would if you're a large healthcare organization. Not to mention the regulations are different in the United States versus Europe about things like privacy or user data. So yeah, there is potentially a, a drawback of this if the organization isn't committed or if the CXO comes in and says, I wanna use X and the next CXO comes in and says, no, 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 we're gonna use Y. And then a couple months or years later, you're using something else. But if you look at what the software vendors are doing and what progressive companies are doing to navigate this new normal, I think that the benefits or the, the, the juice of the HubSpoke model uh, certainly exceeds the, the squeeze. If you... So, you know, I, I obviously am in Slack. A lot of people here are in Slack. What would be the first spoke that you'd want to put in, that the first like ease in if you really wanted to test it out to see how it works? Um, what would you suggest in, in just the general work kind of world? That's a great question. Um, so Slack does basic video calling. In July of 2019, they got rid of screen sharing. They just didn't want to invest the resources in it. So it's not uncommon for an organization to use both Slack and Zoom, even though you can absolutely use Zoom as a hub. But you can use also Zoom not to make it too complicated as a spoke. So if you're curious, you can install the Zoom app for Slack and see how I can initiate a Zoom call right within Slack. Right, And that will help you kind of build the muscle memory for what to expect. Um, project management tools are a good one. I'm also a fan of Google Drive. In fact, if I were to go to, I don't want to show up because I've got some client stuff there, but my particular Slack workspace for my, my company, anytime I set up a Google Doc with a client and they comment in that Google Doc, I don't get an email, I get a notification in Slack. And that is very easy for me to see that Melissa has commented on my Google Doc. So that puts that into context. Um, it's not a bad idea to start small as you're getting your arms around this because the last thing you'd want to do is install 25 apps and build custom bridges to these spokes and make a mistake and realize that someone forgot to get paid. Well, and there's a lot of questions in here about actually using Slack in Microsoft Teams, but we, um, as Phil mentioned, he did a webinar for us last April, right when the pandemic hit, a more um, logistically around Zoom, Slack, and Microsoft Teams. And I'll share that in the follow-up email because a lot of those questions about you know, you're getting pinged from a million directions. How do you kind of organize that and keep that was really addressed in that, um, that webinar. So um, for any questions that, that come in like that, I'll share that webinar for you as well. So if that, if that yeah. works for you. Actually, Melissa, if I may, yeah. uh, let me mm -hmm. uh, go back to sharing my screen because I wrote a blog post that um, actually addresses this. Uh, let's see here, new share. I'll just show this post real quick. Um, hello, there we go. Um, oh, I am sharing my screen, right? Yes. Cool. Um, I wrote a quick post about this guy, Cal Newport, I mentioned before, who effectively equated Slack with Teams. And uh, was it in defense? 
Yep, in defense of Slack, if you go to my site, I effectively explain here some of the ways in Slack that you can customize your notifications. Um, hey, who's that good looking guy? Anyway, um, this just explains some of the ways that you can um, corral your notifications and, and not get overwhelmed. Because you're right, you don't want to be pigging all day, um, not only with a tool like Slack or, or email, but also if you're talking about just in general, um, if you've got people who stop by your office every 15 minutes, right? Hey, Melissa, what are you doing? Hey, Melissa, I have a question. Leave me alone, I'm working. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I actually kind of missed that piece of my work because I'm, I'm such an extrovert, but um, we had someone kind of talk about, you know, where do you see gaps? Where, where do you see the gaps in the existing suite of spokes and ha ha hubs for that matter? What critical tools are missing for us to really achieve streamless remote collaboration, if there are any? Hey, search could always be better. Artificial intelligence could always be better. I was actually talking with someone at Slack a couple of months ago about some of the criticism about notification and whether or not Slack should nudge people more to pause their notification. Um, I'd say that it isn't a technological limitation because, because again, based on the native apps, based on the connectors and based on the tools, you can pretty much build whatever you want. I think the biggest limitation, well, there are a couple of limitations that I think are preventing companies from collaborating as effectively as they could. Plain old inertia, right? Plain old um, aversion to change. And also there's uh, some fault that I think lies with executives as well. Uh, one of the stories I often tell when I'm doing webinars like this is that uh, maybe three months ago, a company reached out to me, a healthcare company, to do some training around Zoom. And I said, okay, you know, Zoom has a lot to it. The, the guy was saying that the um, nurses there at the hospital weren't using Zoom as well as they could. So we talked about some numbers and some training and said, look, an hour max, you have to cover Teams, Zoom, OneNote, and oh, by the way, how computers work. And I said, unless you really want me to talk insanely fast like the FedEx guy from that commercial in the 1970s, and I can't believe how much I'm dating myself. Some of some people, I'm sure, will get the joke. Um, there's no way to do that in an effective way. So the whatever it was, the head of HR said, you know what, we'll just buy a few copies of his book. If you think that nurses coming off a 12-hour shift in a freaking pandemic, are going to go, ooh, what does Phil Simon have to say about Zoom? Let's <laughs> learn. You are out of your freaking mind. So a, a large part, I think, of the blame, Melissa, lies with executives thinking, oh, they're online videos. People can pick this up. No. Uh, senior executives need to communicate to the people underneath them and to the whole organization that your job today is to learn how to use Slack better or Zoom or Teams. So I, I don't think it's so much a technological limitation. Again, it can always be better. I think the tools are there. People just aren't using them for the reasons I mentioned earlier. And so any tips on, I mean, that, that kind of leads into the next question of those who are countering your recommendations with references to the, they're saying, how do you respond to folks that counter your recommendations with references to the history of the paperless office, how far we've come or not come? So how do you dig in a little bit to kind of prove that this is worth it? All right. I mean, I haven't done any peer reviewed research. Um, I've done a bunch of, I mean, I use this stuff myself and I know that it works. And there's a reason, again, if we're looking at a couple of, for lack of a better term, proof points, you know, Slack isn't buying a company for 30, you know, $27 billion because just because. And I think it is important to manage expectations, right? I, I agree with the comment that the paperless office has never arrived, right? Sometimes we see, yes, audiobooks are doing very well and eBooks, but sometimes people want to pick up a physical book. Sometimes people want to meet in person. They don't want to do a Zoom meeting. Zoom fatigue is very much a thing. I'd say rather than reject it outright and say that this guy's off his rocker, and you may be right, um, realize that there's some validity there. And again, if it doesn't make sense to implement throughout the entire organization, I can't tell you that the Slack or the Microsoft police are going to come and arrest you. Uh, but, you know, give it a shot. See if it works on a small scale. I'm a big fan of agile development methods like Scrum. And if it doesn't take in your organization for whatever reason, so be it. But again, I spend a lot of time researching the future work and seeing what these companies are doing. And, and this is the, I mean, Slack wanted to buy, I'm sorry, Microsoft Teams wanted to buy Slack uh, before it went public. Um, this is the way things are going. So I, I don't think putting your head in the sand and pretending that, you know, this is just another fad given what we just went through and the data that I mentioned earlier with employees not wanting to return to nine to five, Monday through Friday and one hour commutes, that ship has really sailed. So I, I really don't think that we're going back. 
we had a few um, design and visual um, collaboration questions. And so the person said they usually use Google Slideshow, but are there better visual options that can connect with these, with these hubs for collaboration? And I think the person specifically an architect to, to give reference. Okay, well, I know that there are tools like Mural that you absolutely can use for design purposes, more of a whiteboard. Microsoft Teams has got a whiteboard functionality. You could actually pin that inside the application. So again, you don't have to leave. Um, I, I'm not an architect. <laughs> so I, I, I mean, I know there are other design collaboration tools like Figma, I mean, even Canva is a tool that I like using and you can allow other people to share. In fact, if you take a look at some of these, what I'll call spokes, they have become more collaborative, right? I can collaborate in Canva, even Spotify, I could share a, a playlist. So a lot of the consumer tools are responding to this trend in collaboration, but um, I'm, I'm, unfortunately I'm not an architect. Um, uh, if I went to Carnegie Mellon, I would have slept even less. <laughs> um, and so we'll close up with um, kind of a different type of question. They, they're interested in you talking more about your transition from college instructor to consulting work. Um, how long did it take to build your brand and what resources did you draw from? It actually went the other way. <laughs> so. Uh, make a very long story. I graduated from Carnegie Mellon back in 1994 and um, wasn't sure about what I wanted to do and worked at a customer relations uh, rep at Sony back when they launched the PlayStation. Now I'm really dating myself, the PS1. Went back to grad school at Cornell because I thought I wanted to work in HR. Realized about 10 minutes in that I wasn't very good at it. I was much more into technology and data. So I spent um, some time, about 10, 12 years, as a consultant helping companies implement enterprise resource planning systems. My specialty was HR and payroll, though I did a lot of reporting. Again, with Carnegie Mellon, I always had a strong background in data and technology. And then started writing books because um, I thought it was interesting and it seemed cheaper than therapy. Uh, and after the seventh book came out, I started thinking about a job as a college professor and actually interviewed at a bunch of places and wound up in Arizona at Arizona State and continued to write books and decided about a year ago to, to go back to being independent. So yeah, if uh, Melissa, you want to privately share my information with someone, I'm happy to have a, a different conversation, but always happy to help out an alumni, alumnus, excuse me, um, because uh, my path was certainly not linear. In fact, one of my favorite books of the last five years is Range by David Epstein. He talks about the benefits of being a generalist and having sort of a weird background for things as opposed to being Tiger Woods, who knew at eight, two years old that he wanted to be a golfer. And guess what? He's arguably the greatest golfer of all time. Uh, the people in that book have very varied backgrounds, but were able to stitch them together in an interesting way and have success that you wouldn't have necessarily expected. Thank you, Phil. I appreciate your expertise uh, sharing what you've researched um, in the past year. And as I mentioned, 10 lucky people will get an offer of your book um, to kind of dig a little bit deeper into, yeah, into what you've said today. And so thank you all for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed the presentation and got some key takeaways to move forward on. Um, I will follow up with a link to the recording of this after we get it captioned. So look for it sometime next week. Um, and I'll also share the link to the previous webinar that Phil hosted uh, around using the collaboration tool, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Slack. Thank you all, and have a great rest of the week.